Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashish Marina. I work in the search outreach team at Google, and I'm based out of Hyderabad. First of all, thank you for coming to this session on internationalization and structured data for search. So uh, before I begin, I just want to ask, how many of you run websites with structured data? Mark up. OK, a fair few. Cool. All right, in this session, we'll be looking at the basics of structured data, what structured data is, how you can use how Google uses structured data, and also what features are powered by structured data. Following that, we'll also be looking at schema.org and some transport, transport layers that Google supports. Following that, we'll also look at some resources. Google provides websites, uh, website owners, so that they can debug any structured data issues they may have. And finally, we'll also look at some best practices for websites which have multiple languages. All right. So I'm sure many of you are aware that Google Search has been constantly evolving to provide a great user experience for all our users. Right? Since 1998, we've moved from blue links to now we have many different features like knowledge panel, live scores, election results. But even today, without structured information from webmasters and content providers, we are still limited by what we can do. Many of our search features depend upon website owners adding structured data and providing that to Google. So only with structured information, Google can provide our users with accurate and attractive information. So in this context, structured data is nothing but the standard format in which you provide us, you provide us or any other search engines your information. So as an example, on the left screenshot, without structured data, the user or the webmaster is telling Google that, uh, or writing about the movie Godfather and relevant information about that movie. But by adding markup, Google understands that they are talking about a movie and that the name of the movie is The Godfather and that the director of the movie is Francis Ford Coppola. Similarly, in the other example screenshot, we are able to tell that the webmaster is talking about a recipe because he's marked up that this is a recipe and he's given relevant information about that particular recipe. OK, so we understand the markup, but how does Google use it? Well, let's assume in an ideal world, everybody uses the same standard markup, and you mark up all of your data, and Google's magical algorithm somehow figure out all that information and provide like a great experience to all our users. But we're still not there yet. Currently, the best user experience that Google can provide to all our users is by the vertical by vertical usage of structured data that you provide us. So we are currently able to provide very rich and faceted experiences for only particular verticals based on the user, based on structured data that you provide us. We use that structured data in both visual and navigational manners. So I'll just explain with using some examples. So in here, we have three different search features. On the left screenshot, we have a rich card for banana bread recipes. So there, because the webmaster has marked up uh, using structured data, we're able to provide a very good image of what the banana bread will look like once, he's eat, once they've made it. And we're also able to tell our users that it takes 1 hour 20 minutes to make it, and also it, you consume 229 calories if you eat one banana bread. In the middle screenshot, it's about a new feature that's been launched earlier this year called Google for Jobs. So this has been launched only in the US, and we are working hard to provide this feature in other locations too. But in this feature, we are able to provide a very good navigational experience for our users. This is purely because for each job listing, website owners are marking up the type of job, the where it's located, and even the pin code. So we're able to help users under, uh, search for the exact jobs in their particular location. For example, in this, someone's searching for jobs near Boston, Massachusetts. And he can further filter that search by saying he wants to look for jobs just in sales and retail. And finally, we also have another example of search features which use structured data, which is the rich snippets. This is the first search feature that we've launched using structured data. 
here we're able, because you've marked up that content, we're able to tell that this particular, the movie Godfather uh, under rogerebert.com is, it has a full five by five rating. Okay, so we've seen what markup is. We've also seen how Google uses it. But how do you send this markup to Google? Well, there are three common transport layers that Google currently supports. They're JSON-LD, Microdata, and XHTML plus RDFA. Currently, Google recommends JSON-LD, but if, even if you use Microdata or RDFA, it's still fine. Uh, these are just syntaxes that you use to encode your data. So why JSON-LD? Well, JSON-LD, as you all know, is a JavaScript notation that you can embed into your HTML using a script, or you can also send it directly as a feed. The thing is, unlike, uh, unlike XHTML and microdata, which are interleaved with the visible text on your page, JSON-LD can let you express your data far more freely. Unlike your content on the layout of your page, it seems very simple but it's far more complex than how it's on the layout of your page. For example, if you want to mark up your nested, uh, nested items, you can tell that you can give the movie name of an, uh, of an event in a particular location. That's very, very easy to do with JSON-LD, but it's hard to do with microdata and uh, RDFA. So apart from JSON-LD, we also have this vocabulary that's standard across all different search engines, which is the schema.org vocabulary. Google and all other major search engines support schema.org vocabulary. And you can use this if you, you don't need to worry about optimizing for all different search engines if you use the schema.org vocabulary. So we recommend using schema.org. But just in case, if you use data vocabulary or microformats, that is also supported. But Right now, this is the most commonly used vocabulary. Uh, you can visit the schema.org website to take a look at all the different data types and the relationship, relationships between different uh, data items. OK, so apart from schema, Google also has its own guidelines. Uh, it's available under developers.google.com. So, we have two types of guidelines, technical guidelines and quality guidelines. Why we have these guidelines is because even though you've marked up your content using schema, sometimes Google still faces trouble getting to your content. For example, some of the common technical guidelines is to make sure all your content is accessible by Google. Everything that you've marked up, Google can access it. One common example of why this guideline was made was because We've seen cases where webmasters use JSON-LD and uh, the script, the JavaScript, and all of that uh, other files are in different folders which Google cannot access. But Google can access just the visible content of a particular page, but the script itself is in a different folder, and Google's robots, uh, the robots file blocks Google from accessing that content. So in that case, we will not be able to see your markup. So let's say you've made a great recipe site and you've marked up everything, and you've got a lot of good ratings. But if Google cannot see that markup, your search snippet will not show those ratings. So I'll, similar to this guideline, there are a lot of other technical guidelines that you can take a look at in uh, Google's developer page. We also have quality guidelines. So quality guidelines are generally there to prevent abuse of, search, uh, of our search results. For example, there are many cases where the user doesn't see the markup but Google sees it. Uh, you can have a recipe website where uh, you mark it as 5x5, five five and only Google sees it, but user doesn't see it. So when they look at the search result, because Google sees your markup, we'll show that, OK, this particular recipe has a 5 out of 5 rating. But when the user goes to your page, he doesn't see that uh, rating, and he feels duped. So which is why we have quality guidelines to make sure the, uh, the users are seeing the same content as what Google is seeing. We also have other guidelines uh, specifically to make sure uh, other data types like events are not uh, abused, because we've seen many cases where 
people use the event schema to sell their coupons or something at 20% off. So one of the major ways we actually made inroads into making structured data easier for everybody to consume and everybody to implement very easily is by having a lot of middleware layers, a lot of CMSs and CMS plugins and platforms, having them support structured data. That made it very useful or very easy for a lot of content providers to create uh, or add markup. In fact, many people who write the content, they have structured data, they have rich snippets, all their features are shown in search very uh, visually appealing, in a visu very visually appealing manner, but they have never touched a single line of code. It's purely possible because there's a lot of plugins for different CMSs and many platforms like LinkedIn provide markup, markup is embedded in the platform, so they don't need to touch a single line of code. So for, from Google's perspective, we've also made a tool called Data Highlighter. This is a tool where you don't need to, if you are unable to access your code, you can simply go to your page and you can use a, you can use a tagging tool to highlight certain parts of your data and you can tell Google what it is. You can even test it out now. It's, this Data Highlighter tool is available in, in your Search Console account. You can simply, uh, one caveat is your pages need to be indexed before uh, you try out this data highlighter tool. So just make sure your pages are indexed, and then you can try and highlight certain parts of the page, and you can see if Google is recognizing it. OK, so you've marked up your content, but now you want to test it out. How do you debug if your structured data is valid or not? Well, the best tool right now we have is the structured data testing tool. In this tool, either the URL for the web page that you want to add, or the specific code snippet which contains the markup, you can add any of these in the tool, and the tool will try and validate your markup. Once you put the URL or the code snippet in here, we're able to pull up all the item types of different data that we find, and we can also show the different warnings and errors that we see on your website. This is based on our own validation that we do in search indexing. So whenever we index a page and we look for structured data, we also use the same validation for, that we show in this particular tool. So if your code is valid in here, that means at least on a technical level, there's no problem. Like Your structured data is good to go. Uh, as for the different warnings and errors, there's generally two types of uh, errors that you'll notice. One type of error is when your code is not at all compatible with uh, schema.org or uh, vocabulary or uh, there's a syntax issue. The other type of error is when your code is not compatible with Google search features. For example, you've seen the jobs feature I've showed you, right? So in the jobs feature, it's a requirement to add the address. So let's say you're listing a job for, I don't know, accountant in Bangalore. But if you don't provide the exact address where he's going to work at, we are not going to validate that code. And that will not be shown in our search uh, rich, in the Google for Jobs rich snippets. Apart from, the, apart from the structured data testing tool, we also have a structured data feature in Search Console. So this feature aggregates all of your structured data information that we found across a certain period of, period of time. And we're able to show all the different data types that we found on your website and all the different errors that we noticed on your website. OK, I, that's, that's all I have for structured data. But before I move on to internationalization, I'd urge you to visit the developer's page for structured data and go through the technical guidelines, specifically because even though schema.org has a number of really, really good data types, Google only supports certain amount of those. So in our developers page, we list, give a list of all the different search features we have and what all data types we provide. So for example, if you use a data type in schema and it's not supported by Google, at least at this moment, it's not very useful in search for that particular feature. All right. Uh, OK, how many of you run websites which have multiple languages? And do you have the same content written in multiple languages, or 
uh, just you have a website for English and you have a website for Hindi. Okay, uh, I didn't understand, but I'm assuming you have the same content in different languages. So I think you already heard a billion times by now about the next billion users and how most of them, at least from India, are looking for local language content. So many of the big websites and even smaller websites are trying to create content alternatively in Hindi too and other Indian local languages. So we have a lot of people creating their, uh, from their old English pages, they're translating that content into Hindi and they're making another website with the same exact content but in different languages. So internationalization in this context is making sure you're letting Google know that all these different versions of your website, the English version, the Hindi version, the Kannada version, all these are the same, and you're letting Google know that these three are the same content, but these are from different languages. So whenever someone from a Hindi state is searching for my content, show him the Hindi page. But if, you, if you're already doing it, I'm sure you know how hard it is to maintain websites with multiple languages. It's very, very hard because many people employ different methods to show their content to their, to their users. But because it's very hard, we've compiled a list of best practices so that at least it gives us a head start for you guys to make these uh, multilingual websites. All right. Let's assume you have a website which has, uh, which you're writing about Bangalore, you know, some place in Bangalore, and you have it in English. If you have the same version in Hindi and Kannada, the best way you can let Google know that the Hindi version and the Kannada version are the same version, are the same content as the English version, but in a different language. The best way you can let Google know that is by using the hreflang tag. Uh, in fact, you can use the hreflang tag in multiple different ways. So for HTML documents, you can simply uh, add a link in the head section of your page saying rel alternate hreflang and then the language code. For non-HTML documents like PDFs, you can simply send a header response with the hreflang tag. And you can also use your sitemap. If you have a website with thousands of pages, you can use a sitemap to make it easier for you to add the hreflang tag and let Google know that you have, okay, these thousand pages are English and the exact uh, versions of this page in Hindi are these versions. Here's an example code. So for the first one, you're basically set, telling Google that in.example.com slash page is the English Indian version of that particular page. So this page has probably has content in maybe INR. So you're, let's say you're selling a shoe, and this page has content in INR. And then you have another page, us.example.com, which you, you tag it as hreflang enus. This page, you probably have USD, so you're targeting it, targeting it towards US customers. And finally, you have a default page for everyone, every other person from you know, all other parts of the world. So some common mistakes that we notice when people implement hreflang is they add this code in only one page, but the, so, for example, all these three uh, alternate tags are added only in the in.example.com slash page, but you don't find these tags in the US page or the default page. So if, we, if Google doesn't see the back tags, it will assume that we, it will not be able to consolidate all the signals and will not be able to understand that all three pages are the same, uh, same content in different languages. Another mistake is people sometimes misuse uh, or incorrectly uh, add a wrong uh, language code. So you're supposed to use ISO codes, so please keep that in mind. And uh, so this was a recommendation that we did previously. We used to ask for people to add rel canonical tags in these pages, but uh, right now it's easier for us, to, for, for us to make sure you don't add rel canonical tags because many people are doing it in a wrong manner. So we stopped giving the recommendation of adding rel canonical tag. All right, so you've seen the previous example where we had a different URL for the English Indian customers, you had a different URL for US customers, and you had a different URL for the rest of the world. So that's the right way to do internationalization. 
So many cases we've seen where people simply use cookies to assume the language of whoever is visiting your website, and they'll just directly show you that version. So I'm sure all of you have probably visited a very big website, and if you are in, like, say, a Hindi-speaking state, sometimes you directly get the Hindi version of that website. But your, the default version that you always use is English. So that can be a bad experience for users. And even for search engines, if you do not, uh, if you do not have separate URLs, it's very hard for us to figure out that, OK, this is the English version, this is the Hindi version, this is the Kannada version. We'll just assume there's only one version, and whichever that version is, we'll index it. So your content in the other languages is not indexed. And that's bad for both you and your users. OK, this sounds very obvious, but we've seen many cases where you have the Bangalore page in English, but what happens in the Hindi page is only the boilerplate template is translated, but the actual content within the page, that's not translated. So Google doesn't use code level attributes like lang that uh, people add. Google doesn't use that to determine what language a page is. Google actually looks at the content and the text of a page to determine which language that page uh, has. So if you have, like, say, the template is in one language and the content is in another language, that makes it hard for Google to understand which language that page is. And we'll just pick one based on some signals, and uh, we'll probably show it to the wrong audience, which is very, very bad for you and for your users. Your users. OK, so we've seen a case where we told you not to redirect people from the English page to the Hindi page or the Kannada page based on cookies or other information that you may have, right? Well, how do you then, how does people, someone who lands on your English page, how does he visit your Hindi page? Well, you've got to make sure there's a small option for him to visit the other versions of your website. That way, even if, they, if, even if they land on the wrong page or even if the search engine makes a mistake and sends, him, sends an English user to the Hindi version, he can simply click on the language button and visit the English version. And finally, don't worry about duplicate content. So many people who, because there are thousands of pages and thousands of versions of uh, your website, you end up worrying about duplicate content and thinking whether it, you'll be penalized for this or your ranking will go down. That it's, don't worry about any duplicate content penalty. The only issue here is if we don't detect your pages in other languages, those pages will not be ranked. But the pages that are detected are ranked. So even if you make a mistake, it's not going to affect you in a bad manner. It's just not going to show the pages that, you're, that we are supposed to show. Uh, that's pretty much it for my session. So if you have any questions, please, uh, we don't have a booth, but uh, we'll just be at the Hall 3A. Thank you. <laughs>